Welcome to the One Minute Preceptor Podcast, your resource for clinical rotation advice and tips to prepare for your externships in healthcare. Learn how to earn letters of recommendation, prepare for your clerkship, and excel at patient care from preceptors with years of practice. We interview physician educators in every specialty and clinical setting to discuss how to prepare for your rotation and improve your clinical experience. Here's your host and MedEd entrepreneur, Chase DeMarco. So welcome back to the One Minute Preceptor podcast. And this season, we are starting to cover some new materials. We're going to get into a wider perspective of medical educators and pre-med educators and faculty development and really delve into the main topics that are really approaching medical sciences and how it's changing. And today we have William Davis, who is going to start discussing with us some very important topics on where medicine might be going. and. I don't want to say too much ahead of time. So first, let's have you explain a little bit about your history and why medical education in particular is important for you. Great. Thank you, Chase, for having me on today. My name is William Davis. I'm an assistant professor of science and technology studies at California North State University College of Health Sciences. I'm also the chair of our humanities and social science department here. My background, my first degrees, my undergraduate and my first master's degree are in literature. And then I switched to something called science and technology studies, which is a mouthful and a bit confusing. We essentially in STS, science and technology studies, it's an interdisciplinary program that looks at the history, philosophy, and sociology of science and technology. And so how that plays out for me and what that looks like where I work is I teach largely undergraduates as well as our pre-medical post-baccalaureate students. So those are students that have already finished their undergraduate degree, and they're looking to transition into a professional school. So maybe pharmacy, medicine, dentistry. And what I teach with them are two undergraduate classes, upper division. One is a moral philosophy class, broadly looking at contemporary issues in society and applying moral philosophical theories to that. And the other course that I teach is a bioethics course, and that is going to involve most directly, obviously, topics in bioethics and a little bit of medical ethics as well. My background in terms of my dissertation, my PhD, one of my focuses was philosophy of technology. And so I am quite interested in how, for instance, in this case, our students are being trained, what kinds of technology we are using, and from a normative perspective, how we should be doing this. And one of the things that I'm interested in based on Chase, your own work from your podcast to your writing as well, is this idea that, you know, we perhaps could use more technologies. And one of the things that we could use them for would be to perhaps diminish education costs and things like that. And so I am very attuned to that idea. And what I'm interested in in figuring out is, okay, how are some of the best ways that we can promote the use of these kinds of technologies in creating the absolute best health practitioners possible. And that's a pretty broad, I think, strokes overview of my background and what I do. Yeah, and there's definitely a lot that can relate to the topics we're going to discuss. And I think the aspect of technology, even from these educational podcasts, are going to greatly shape the way and the future of medical education. And part of what I think I found interesting in your article that I read and how we were introduced was some of the bioethical concerns and technology concerns that you brought up. So That's going to shape some of the questions. We're going to try to cover some of the topics for later in this interview. But I do want to start off with a quick icebreaker type question. I'm switching it from the one I used to have in season one, just to get a new perspective from an educator's point of view. And that is, what is the most outrageous thing that you've seen in an educational setting or an academic setting, especially if you have one for medicine? Well, our undergraduate college, we have one you know, Bachelor of Science degree that we offer, and it's in health sciences. And so everybody who is starting with our college, they are absolutely interested in the vast majority of them, at the very least, um, in going into professional school. And one of the things that is somewhat amusing and, and somewhat disheartening when I hear students say, oh, I'm really excited, you know, I'm studying in the health sciences, and that means I won't have a lot of humanities or social science classes. And I can really just focus on the physical and life sciences and math. And I got to tell you, you know, Chase, that always abuses me because I'm thinking to myself, well, of course, there's a lot of reading that's going to be involved in this class, in all of your classes and all of your coursework. But also, you know, in terms of the work that they're going to be doing, they're absolutely going to need to know 
you know, subjects like psychology and, and sociology. So that might be one of the funnier things that I've heard. So it's sort of that misinterpretation, which is something I remember hearing in undergrad too, that maybe the social sciences, the soft sciences aren't going to be as important for a medical learner. Yes. And again, I think that runs just counter to the switch in the MCAT about five years ago with this new emphasis on the biopsychosocial model, right? And that's coming out of the 70s with Engel and this promotion of different psychological and sociological determinants of health. In other words, moving a bit away from the biomedical model, not to say that the biomedical model is bad. I'm in no way trying to say that, but it is insufficient by itself. And so that's one of the things that, again, I think is quite interesting to me and might be something that we could continue to talk about today and and might be of use to some of your listeners as well. Actually, that's definitely one of the topics I wanted to bring up. And your article, A Gathering Crowd, Collective Intelligence and Medicine, which we'll have the link in the show notes, that is one of the topics that you brought up. And I'm kind of curious to understand what undergraduate professors and pre-meds think about when it comes to the changes in you know, we have the MCAT, then we have medical school, then we have the USMLE for the board exams, then we go into a more focused clinical education before actually becoming doctors. And how is the interpretation and understanding of those changes from your and your students' point of view currently? I would say, so in particular, my college, we're a fairly interdisciplinary college in the sense that we only really have two main departments, humanities and social sciences and math and physical and life sciences. And even then, we're still fairly blended. So in terms of our faculty distribution, our physical and life science faculty are directly across the hall from some of our humanities and social science faculty. So we're interacting from a faculty perspective with each other. Our students are witnessing this. And I think that's pretty important because we can say all the right things to our students. Oh, the importance of writing or the importance of attentive listening, something that we take from narrative medicine, for instance. But if they're not seeing it in practice, so the student isn't seeing it in practice, I think that's part of the problem that we would have to address. So that's one of the things that we're trying to emphasize more at our college is whether it's something like close reading or writing, it's going to be a part of all of the education and it's not going to stop once you finish the undergraduate degree. But there is also that side and I think a student could rightly say, but come on, William, the MCAT is mainly going to focus on, you know, the bio, the chem, a little bit of the physics, the math. Like, yeah, there's a little bit on the psychosocial, a little bit on the critical analysis and reasoning, but the real meat, the hard part, that's going to come from the physical life sciences and math. That's going to be a perception of the students. And I think that they're right. That's what the MCAT is showing them and is teaching them. But this shift, you know, in 2015, when they changed the MCAT, and I believe that's the correct date, I think it was 2015 when it changed. That is at an institutional level saying to current and future practitioners, we need to reevaluate how we are training this next generation of medical practitioners. And in our colleges, we are absolutely in support of that. I know my colleagues are. We're trying to figure out ways to integrate assignments across disciplines, across courses, so that students are really able to see I need to be this kind of whole practitioner, not somebody who's really good at particular things. Because again, to give a little bit away, you know, in terms of my thoughts on machines, particularly things like apps and computers, they do things really well, right? In terms of like recall, their recall is perfect, it's flawless, and the speed can't be matched by a person. So don't compete is the way we think about it with our students. There's no need to compete with that, but how do you work with that? How do you use that? to become a better practitioner? And then how do you use that with patients? Because they also, I think, need to be taught a little bit. And again, I might be giving a little bit too much away and jumping ahead here, but we know that patients are going to go online and look up whatever they think they have. They're going to look up symptoms in advance. Does the practitioner want to ignore that? Does the practitioner want to incorporate that? Do they want to use that as a teaching moment with their patient? That's something I think that if we're able to talk more about that with our students now, from the undergraduate to the professional level, I think it's just going to make them have stronger relationships with patients in the future. I definitely agree. And I think the health 2.0 discussion is something that was mentioned in your article and something we can come back to in a minute. And I think my interpretation of the changes being made on some of these educational boundaries and exams, Mm -hmm. standardized testing, is probably 
unique in that I happen to have gone to one of the schools that didn't require the MCAT for the application process. So I started studying for it, but I didn't have to go through that rigorous exam process there. And I'm not as familiar with the changes that have been made, I suppose, because of that. I do try to keep up with some of the forums and read what other current pre-meds are discussing. Right. And it sounds like they're along the same lines as what some of the changes are happening in the USMLE, the board exams there. We always had coursework and study materials that were based on bioethics, medical ethics, psychology, and some of these other, I would say, more administrative topics too, to a small degree, okay. but they weren't really often seen on the actual practice exams for the board exams. So students did not dedicate much time to it. It's like, oh, right. okay, it's there, but it's not really highly important. It's not high yield, so we're not going to focus on it. And I think that is one of the issues with these standardized exams is just that they are going to, for better or worse, guide where our studies go. I can't agree with you more, Chase. I think the way you phrase that, right, the high yield kinds of questions, that's exactly what our students, and I think you're right, they should be looking at it this way. Well, what are the things that I need to know to pass this barrier so that I can get to this next level so that I can then, you know, move on to get that degree or, you know, I need to pass step one, pass step two. It makes complete sense that they're going to focus on that. And again, to jump slightly ahead, my issue is not with software like uh, the Human Diagnosis Project or, or again, something along those lines where we're using online means to improve diagnostic capabilities. In no way am I saying that's a bad thing. But my concern is, are we showing you know, this next generation of doctors that really the most important thing, we're going to, you know, kind of wave our hands and say, oh, you know, the psychological, the sociological, this, you know, bioethics, those are important things, but really the most important things, that's what we're going to test. And so maybe part of the problem is we as educators, and I'm looking and blaming myself in some ways here, I need to, we need to figure out better ways, perhaps to have some sort of standard evaluation for questions that might be drawn from exactly what you were saying, like a bioethics course, medical ethics course. How can we evaluate students' knowledge and students' understanding of that? It's probably going to be more qualitative than quantitative, but no, I think that's an excellent point that you're making, that students, they're going to focus on the things that they're being tested on. So one of the things I just think we should be very careful with is not flattening a patient into a chart. And I don't think that you or, and I've listened to many of your other podcasts, I don't think any of your guests are promoting that idea. Really what I'm hearing a lot of the guests that you've had on this podcast in your first season talk about was in some ways how to have a resident take ownership of a patient or, you know, how to have these medical students really feel like that they are responsible. And I think the more that can happen, the more the students feels responsible I think that's going to increase the likelihood that they're going to have a better understanding. They're going to try to make a stronger relationship with that patient. Definitely agree there. And I do wonder about the interdisciplinary approach, as you discussed within your school, the different degrees, the different instructors can talk within each other, amongst each other, and really try to isolate the points that they all agree are important for the students as a whole. But I don't necessarily, and this could just be from personal experience mm-hmm. and stories I've heard, see that happening as much from the different tiers. For instance, from undergrad to the basic science instructors in your first two years of med school to the clinical preceptors in your second two years, or even higher up to the residency directors and the attendings that help teach the residents in their early, I guess, academic profession. Mm-hmm. And This probably does happen to some degree and in some hospitals and universities, probably the larger ones more so, but there doesn't seem to be a great way, especially for smaller schools like mine, for that type of communication to happen easily. A lot of professors and preceptors don't know what resources might be available to them. And I wonder if there's a good way to sort of bridge those gaps and make sure that everyone within all the different tiers of our medical education are on the same page. That's a great point that you're making. and. I also want to know exactly how to make that happen, right? I mean, one of the challenges is, especially for an undergrad, and I'll just speak to what I know better here, which is the undergraduate side of this. When you're trained from the humanity side, if you're trained as a 
English faculty, if you're trained as a, a philosophy faculty, if you were trained as, even on the other side, chemistry or biology faculty, you were trained most likely, and again, I'm eager for people to disagree with me on this, but you were trained, broadly speaking, in a silo. You were trained by people who were chemists, they wanted to be chemists, or you were trained by biologists, they wanted to be biologists, and they expected in some way you to emulate them. What I think is, is pretty fascinating from the undergraduate side is our students do not want to be like us. They, in a very real way, want to have a very different kind of career. Nevertheless, they need what each of our disciplines has to offer. And so one of the things that, and this might be a theme broadly, one of the things that we have to do as educators, and I'm going to be candid, we have to put our egos aside a bit and acknowledge the fact that everything that I have learned is not something that I need to try to impart to my students. I need to be cognizant of the fact that they are getting a lot of information from a lot of different disciplines and they're the site of synthesis. And that's absolutely a challenge for someone in their mid-20s, but it's certainly a challenge for somebody in their late teens. And if we don't provide them with good models, if we don't show them really well how to do that, then I think we're not serving them as well, right? If we just think of it as, oh, well, I'm going to go in and I'm going to teach my piece. And it's up to the student to really make that connection. And they've got to figure out how to put this all together and be that whole practitioner. We're going to let them down. So what do we have to do? Maybe some of the things that we have to do is we have to engage more directly with other faculty that we're working with. Some of the things that we do at our college, which is many other colleges do this, which we borrowed from other places, is this idea of teaching circles where, you know, faculty in bio, in English, in communication, in philosophy, we're attending some of each other's classes, not to evaluate the other faculty member, but just to observe what are some of the topics, what are some of the things that they're going over. And one of the things that I found every time I've done this with other faculty is there are actually direct connections between what I'm doing and what they're doing. It requires more than just saying, hey, I'm going to send you my syllabus. You send me your syllabus. We'll try to figure out, you know, some week or day that we can get together with our classes or something like that. It takes a lot more direct communication. That's my theme. So that won't surprise you. I'm going to say we've got to have better communication from the faculty side as well. And then we've got to be strong models for our students. Definitely the ego aspect is something I hear constantly on all of the shows that I've really interviewed, even inside the boards, I do some guest interviews for. And the clinicians that we get seem to be, we're lucky in our ability to attain some very informative and very open-minded physicians. But I can definitely say from personal experience, that is not everyone out there. It might not even be the majority of current practicing physicians. I'm not entirely sure. Depends on where you are, I'm sure, as well, and who your demographics are and many other factors. But Getting rid of that ego is something that a lot of physicians and a lot of preceptors and educators in general might find difficult or were not trained in or don't necessarily have the leadership skills in. And that's something that we still don't see being trained into the pre-med and medical students to a significant degree. You know, some schools do have some programs they're implementing or electives that students can take, but it's not very widespread. And I would say the same thing kind of goes with the faculty conversations in and amongst themselves, sometimes you might find a school that within the school, the faculty will talk. But what are their counterparts in other institutions doing? What are their counterparts in other countries doing? How can we all communicate better and learn from each other and improve and really open up these lines of communication? The best way I've found so far is probably through podcasts, but even though that has the generalizability of communication, it still makes it difficult to reach a wide audience because there's still a significant portion of the country or of educators or of medical students that don't listen to podcasts. So I'm not sure if there is an answer, but I'd be happy to hear what your thoughts on it are. I don't think that there's one, you know, magical solution. I think you're hitting on some really important points, right? When you talk about podcasting, we're trying to make available to this generation of students the information We're trying to make it available to them in a way that they not just can, but that they actually will engage with. And sure, you know, podcasting can be fairly, it it is one directional, right? I mean, it's us speaking 
and someone else listening, but they are able to write in, they are able to add comments and feedback. And if we begin to take some you know, podcasts and begin to use them for educational purposes, are there ways that we can have students you know, respond to something that they've heard and seen? And by the way, I'm not pretending that that doesn't happen. It does happen. It happens all over the country, likely all over the world in different institutions. But something, again, to come back to one of your previous guests in, in the first season, this idea of standardizing education. I'm swayed by that in some ways. You know, I like this idea of, well, you know, we'll have medical students that do have a solid background in, you know, one, two, three, four, and five, right? And that seems like a great idea. But of course, you know, we do want to leave open this idea that, you know, different schools might have different flares or have different emphases that they really want to push forward. And so that's still an open conversation, right? How much do we want medicine to be standardized, right? If you're a patient, and it'd probably be better if I asked myself this question, even though I know obviously physicians are patients too, but do I want the same patient experience, whether I'm in California or I'm in Virginia or I'm in France or I'm in Taiwan? As a patient, sure, in some ways, right? And you've got the electronic medical records, you know, this idea of, well, if we standardize the form that all this information is taken in, would that help in some ways? Yes, I think it could. But do we want to have physicians that are essentially automatons, that they're just, they've been programmed in certain ways and they're going to act those programs out. They're going to follow the algorithm. We don't want that, I don't think. And so that's the balance. That's, I think, the push and the pull of how do we ensure that we are absolutely imparting to students enough variance that they do feel that they can be individuals, that they do have you know, individual relationships with their patients, but at the same time, that they're always following best practices. And I think one of the things that you're doing here, which is great, is giving this forum where you're allowing kind of freeform conversation to happen so that others can hear this and then they can weigh in and give feedback. I don't pretend the things that I say, you know, here or elsewhere are law and should absolutely be followed. It's quite the opposite. I'm much more interested in engaging with some of these ideas and having pushback, especially and that's why I'm really excited to be talking to you today. Someone who has gone through a lot of this educational process already, because you're going to have a perspective that I just necessarily cannot have. And so one of the things that you know, we need to be attuned to as educators is what is it that the students need? What is it that the students want? And then how do we best meet them there? Yeah, hopefully this does turn out to be more of a public forum, a place that other educators and other physicians can listen to the conversation and weigh in on, come on the show. I'd definitely be happy to have anyone listening in on the show to discuss if their thoughts and views differ from what we're going to discuss. And I know one thing that you bring up a lot in your article, and you've brought up several times in the conversation already, is the patient care setting of this Health 2.0, of using technology. And you know, my experience is much more on the educational side of it. So I kind of want to tackle this one next because it seems like our vastly different goals and endpoints here might make for an interesting conversation on the pros and cons of using these technologies in medical education. I mean, let me ask you a question then. So if you're in the exam room with a patient, one of the things that I would want to know is how are you going to use the machines that are in that room, right? So maybe you've got one on your wrist, maybe you're typing into one, it's a tablet or it's a laptop. Is it one way? So the way that I would think about that is, in other words, like, are we turning the machine around so that the patient is sitting with you and you're both looking at the screen together? Or are you, and again, it might be you know, fair to say like, no, I'm just filling out some information that I have to fill out and then I'm going to talk to the patient. But from the patient side, we're often wondering like, well, wait a minute, what are they doing? What are they typing? Is this about me? Is this something else? And so I feel like there's that. And I don't know the answer. I don't know exactly what it really should look like. But I can say that what I think it should look like is something where the patient is involved with the physician. And I have no idea whether that's practical, Chase. I have no idea whether that's something <laughs> that you could even do. Again, I've mentioned narrative medicine. I'm enamored and fascinated with Columbia University, Rita Charon, and the work that they're doing there. This idea with attentive listening, perhaps even having like a scribe or a witness in the room where there's a witness sounds weird again, because it almost makes it seem like someone's being evaluated. But having that person in the room who doesn't have that high medical training, but does have training in the ability to write down what's going on. Right. So that would free up the physician to, they know that someone else is taking notes. They know that 
someone else is potentially able to continue that discussion, not on the medical side, again, not making diagnoses and not offering you know, therapeutic advice to the patient, but able to continue that conversation when the 10 to 15 minutes are up, you know, if you've got to move on to that next patient. Because I think it sounds all well and good, you know, when I say, oh, we should have 30 to 45 minutes with each patient and really get to know them. Sure. I'm aware that that is just, from an economic standpoint, not really possible in most, if not almost all situations. Okay, what is possible? How do we leverage these different technologies? And again, the technology could, in this case, just be another person in that room, but how should we be? And again, I'm long-winded, so I apologize, but I was asking you, what's your preferred mode when you're in that room with the patient? How do you want to use those devices? Do you want them to come in between? Do you want them to be aiding that relationship? In other words, helping you know, both of you to use it at the same time. What's your perspective on that? Oh, that's a tricky one. So I've had such a variety of experiences and the scribe type experience you're describing is actually one I only had prior to medical school when I was volunteering at a medical clinic. And maybe because it was a free clinic or because they just had a different type of smaller setup there, it gave access to us scribes to go in with the physician and try to write down notes on the computer as they're having the direct communication. So the physician was able to focus more on the patient. And I do get the impression that patients enjoyed that much more. Of course, the issue comes in with scribes mis interpreting what the physician yes. was saying or misspelling something. I'm a terrible yes. speller. It was definitely an issue I had. And then what happens if the physician comes out of the room expecting that the scribe wrote this down and then you forget something? And that could be very, very severe. So in yes. the right environment, I can definitely see the benefit of it. In the family practice, private practice type setting, you go to your GP. I have seen it, but I've not experienced it personally in that type of mm -hmm. setting. And it would be pretty difficult in most hospital settings, especially faster paced hospitals. Yeah, there are definitely pros and cons depending on Fair the enough. environment. So yes. I don't really have a good answer for that one. Yeah. I think it's the case too, every time we're introducing a different technology or every time we're, you know, in your case, like a different tool, a diagnostic tool, for instance, it's going to take learning and there is always the potential for error. I don't think that this would eliminate error. But if we're talking about having patients feel more open, having patients feel the ability to connect more directly with the physician, even if it adds the potential for future error. I, I don't know. I wonder if that's a trade-off that someone would be willing to make because I think it is something that it could be tested, it could be tried out. And as you mentioned too, I think it does happen in some situations. It also might be something that you know eventually we look back and say like, yeah, that was an interesting idea, but that just totally doesn't work in a hospital, like you said, in a really fast-paced environment. Okay, well, where might it be able to work? Now, again, we're talking about expensive things, right? Humans are expensive. You've got to have them trained. We've got to have them be accurate, as you've said. That's true, but it would require far less training than that needed for a physician. And so as we make this transition to, well, the machine can do all this recording, it can transcribe the things that were said. Okay, well, then what would a, you know, we could call them a technician or an assistant, what would that person be doing? And what would that kind of job or role look like? I don't have the answer necessarily for that, but that's something that, you know, down the road we could be looking at. And again, as just as an option to consider. Yeah. And currently in many hospitals, the physician will come out of the room or a surgery or whatever their environment might be, and they'll dictate the notes. And then whoever's on the other line will write them up. So there is definitely a potential for something like that. And with the dictation, it saves you the issue of having another person physically following you around and potentially mm -hmm. clogging up, especially older, more narrow hospital hallways and such. Fair enough. There's definitely some ways to utilize these types of ideas and technologies, and I'm sure they are being used in more ways than I'm aware of. I can only speak from personal experiences, and I do like the idea that it brings about a little bit more one-on-one -on -one time with the physician and the patient, which everyone seems to enjoy and want. Of course, we'd have to be concerned with HIPAA laws and such, but if there's already dictation happening, then obviously those obstacles have been overcome, at least in some hospital settings. I think that's something that's surmountable. And it would take a shift in perspective, right? We would have to see this as the patient would need to understand what that person is doing there. And again, I don't think that this would be something that could happen in a day or a year it would be something that could likely take time. 
But it's also the case that we do adjust. I mean, your profession, you're adjusting to electronic medical records, right? And we can look at, uh, you know, from op-eds in the New York Times to other places where, again, MDs are writing in and saying, I feel like a really intelligent, highly educated, essentially programmer, right? What I'm doing is I'm just typing in, I'm a typist, you know, I'm putting this information into the machine and that's where I'm spending a lot of my time. How do we shift some of that burden? You know, again, fairly, I'll say like, I don't know the answer to that, but that seems if we can give the physician her time back in some way, if we can free her up and maybe it just takes better integration of an electronic medical record. I'm not exactly sure, but even on that side, right, to say that this record is then transferable to any institution, then we have to, again, have to worry about privacy concerns, have to worry about where this information is going, how it's being used and who has access to it. And those are thorny issues that we're also certainly not going to solve in a conversation today, but something for us to keep in mind, because as we push for efficiency, what are we willing to trade to make something happen faster or to make something happen cheaper or more cheaply? What are we willing to trade off? Are we willing to trade off privacy? Are we willing to trade off accuracy? Because I think we're not always explicit about this trade-off, though I think we should be. Yeah, there's always a trade-off. And from the educational setting, are there particular technologies that you see your students, for instance, using or that you've heard of that you recommend to them for when they get to medical school? You know, Chase, I might not be the best person to ask on that because I'm one of those strange people that I'm going to recommend writing. Now, again, students using a stylus and a kind of screen that they can write on, sure, that's a kind of writing too. But trying to go, you know, very intentionally with taking notes. That's something that I think, you know, again, there's studies out there that are pointing to the efficacy of this, where if you're typing, it's, again, I can not be paying much attention to what's going on around me and type something. And again, we can argue about whether, you know, with handwriting, something similar is going on. But I don't know, I'm going to back away from that question, because I don't have any, okay, well, let me say this, and this will be a plug. I think they should listen to more podcasts like this one, and reflect on what they're hearing and do a little bit of writing, whether it's written in a journal or typing it up and sending it to people like Chase DeMarco. That's what I think they should be. (laughs) Thank you for the (laughs) plug. I like it. Yeah, we cover a lot of those topics in the other show too, the medical anemonist. And there are definitely a lot of studies showing anyone can type up and basically act as a scribe and not think about it. But when you're handwriting, you can't necessarily write down everything as fast as someone speaking, you have to synthesize it in a way that makes sense to you. So that ability right there, and then there's the whole tactile aspect of writing that seems to link to stronger memories and tons of research on that stuff. And I do love the aspect of educational podcasts. The one issue I find is for certain types of podcasts, at least for me, if I'm listening to ones that are about content, it's very difficult for me to really utilize that information. It becomes a passive learning where I'm like, oh, that's cool. But then I don't put it in a flashcard deck or I don't write it down because I'm probably driving or something along those lines. And then it doesn't stick. So that's why with other show, I really try to focus on active learning techniques, accelerated learning techniques, how to make the most of your time. I'm not concentrating on the medical content. I'm not going Mm -hmm. over questions from a question bank or a textbook with you. I'm teaching you on how to cover this material better yourself. That's, I guess, my advice for a podcast is see what works out for you. Everyone's different, but don't keep using one where you're not actually retaining any benefit. I feel like that is interesting when we talk about online education broadly. And so are there certain topics and areas that would lend themselves quite well maybe to to online education? I think so. But I think you've hit on it exactly. If you're not engaging with the material, and giving a perspective, whether it's written, spoken, then I think, you know, you're going to have a harder time retaining it and then just making it real for you. You know, one of the things, I mean, it's fairly cliche, right? You know, using writing to make your ideas clear, even just your own ideas, right? You can read something or hear something in particular or watch it and say, oh, yeah, 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 that's easy. That makes sense, right? And I think this is where we are in 2020 with how-to videos, like you watch something, you know, and you're like, oh, yeah, 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 that makes sense. Okay, now can you actually do that? And then can you talk about it? Can you explain it? So whether it's in, you know, kind of the philosophy classes that I'm teaching, bioethics, something like that, I'm not interested in whether the student can memorize something and then 
parrot it back to me. The idea would be, okay, can you put that into terms that make sense to you, make sense to others as well? Because I think that's your challenge as somebody who, like you, extremely educated in a fairly esoteric body of knowledge. Can you talk to me, the patient, this general person, can you talk to us in ways that we can understand? Because if you go over our heads, we stop listening. We might not follow directions. So how do you explain things to us? I don't want to say dumbing it down, right? Because again, when I were you know, being somewhat offensive here, but how do you simplify things without losing the specific content, right? And that's broadly speaking what we're doing with metaphors generally. You're trying to say something in a different way using different kinds of terms, but gets at a similar meaning. Of course, you're going to lose a little bit of the specificity there, but that's, again, we talked about trade-offs. That comes back to this idea of trade-off. Of course, there's going to be that. But if you're showing the patient that she should trust you, then there's advantages there. And if you're even able to say, and again, I don't know how comfortable you might be or others might be with this, comfortable saying, I don't know. Like, oh my gosh, that's a good, you know, let's look into that together or let me look into that and come back to you. I don't know how comfortable that is because I think, you know, the United States, I'll just speak with this culture is the one I'm most familiar with. We want doctors to be correct. We have this, you know, again, you see it in TV and film, this idea of infallibility, like you couldn't be wrong. Of course you can be. And because you're, you know, as human as the rest of us, however, if it's something that you're, you know, trying to hang your practice on, like, oh, well, I don't make mistakes or my accuracy rate is this level, that's where I get concerned. And that's maybe when I, you know, to come back to this idea of human DX, the human diagnosis project, I have no problem with human DX. I think it's a really neat idea. My concern is, are we going to create some, at the very least, students and practitioners that are the mostly focused on increasing their score? Yeah, well, my, you know, accuracy level has gone from 86.3 to 94.2. That's interesting, but I don't know. I feel like in the meantime, we've flattened patients. We've made them seem like nothing more than what's on the chart. And for perhaps many, many, many situations in a medical encounter, that's just fine. But what happens when it isn't? What happens when we're training a practitioner to be correct and we're not also training her to listen really well or listen for answers that she wasn't expecting? But I realized too, all of this feeds back into how much time do you really have? And so that's why I'm fascinated when you're talking about these learning techniques, like how do you get this information quickly? Because I think that's kind of a microcosm of what you're doing as that practitioner. You have a very short window of time to talk to these patients. And you've got to, again, as much as you can come up with, from that day of the one minute preceptor even, you've got to come up with an idea, right? And something that you're willing to kind of stand behind and say, no, I think this is what's going on. How do you build into that uncertainty and the acknowledgement of it? Because from a patient perspective, we know well, I mean, I'm going to go look that up online, whatever Dr. DeMarco just told me. I'm going to go look that up. I'm going to check it with someone else. Physicians know that too, right? You know that there's that potential. And in some ways, you probably want it, right? That, well, yeah, go get that second, that third, that whatever opinion. And that's something I think that we, you know, we want to make sure that we retain. But at the same time, we want our physicians, I think, um, at the very least, to have that level of humility to where they're acknowledging the fact that they don't need to know everything. Now, it's easy to say things like that. I'm not an MD, so I don't know what that sounds like from your side. No, I think it goes back to the same thing with the ego with educators and physicians is even from an early age, you're dealing with medical students, hyper competitive for the most part. They are usually some of the top in their class. And now they're all thrown into a group that they're all equal. And the last thing they want to admit to each other or to their instructor often is that they're wrong. And it's it starts to snowball from there and leads into doing the same thing as a physician. So a lot of discussions that I've had with past interviews and past guests is, first off, maybe the student's not aware of this instance or how to correct their action, how to become mm-hmm. mindful of their mistakes they're making, and also have a plan for attacking those mistakes, a plan for overcoming those obstacles. But I did want To loop back around too, for the aspect of online courses, I find that a lot of people misinterpret online courses as being passive. And I'm under the impression that they are no more or less passive than sitting in class for a lecture. The only difference is how it's set up. 
you can definitely set up a lecture hall where you have several hundred students in there and people in the back are watching YouTube videos or chatting with each other. They're not interacting. They're learning passively if they're learning at all with the lecture. Same with online courses. If they're set up to be passive, if it's set up so you can just stream videos and there's no interaction that's required, there's no in-video questions that pop up randomly to make sure that the student is going to be sitting down and hit the button to be able to continue on with the video or to even something I tried to implement in online micro course that I created was to prime them ahead of each module with, hey, are you using this active technique? Hey, are you writing down this stuff? Are you trying to use mnemonics or any of these other study techniques to try to get them in the mindset before they even start the module? Hmm, Maybe I'll try this out instead of just watching the videos passively. So I really think it just comes to course design with any kind of technology we're using. No, I think you're absolutely right. And that's why I'm excited for you, people like you and your generation. And again, I guess it could be people my generation. I'm just not as adept and skilled at teaching online. But I think you're absolutely right. You could have a brick and mortar, you know, in-person kind of class that is completely unidirectional. It's just the teacher talking. Student might take a quiz or a test or something like that, but they're not really engaging with the material. Or, and again, I think this is a, a great idea that you have, right? Like asking them in advance of a module, try this, or just recommending, you know, try this out, try this technique out. I think that's excellent, right? Because what you're doing is you're showing the student that you're paying attention and that you're really trying to help them get the most out of a class. And the problem, and I'll just say it's, it's me and in some ways my generation, I don't want to speak for others. I'll just say myself, the way I was largely trained was not in such an interactive way using technology. Now, in class discussion, yes, that was fairly normal. But how do I best use these technologies to deliver something online? Because as you know, you can do this poorly. And I will be embarrassed to say this for all of the students that have had to deal with it years ago. Like I have not been the best when I've taught online because I've mimicked what I tried to do in person, right? So I'll record a lecture and have people listen to it, right? And if I'm not putting, if I'm not embedding questions, as you say, then I'm, you know, in some way I'm allowing that student to say like, yeah, I'm going to listen to this in the car. You know, it's important and all, but I can do other things at the same time. That's what we don't want. It's not necessarily a danger. It's, it's just that twin edge of the technologies that Yes, they allow you to be mobile. They allow you to be getting this kind of information, accessing it from a wide variety of places, not just sitting in a desk in a classroom. But it also allows all sorts of other things to be going on at the exact same time. And if we're not directive with students, if we're not talking with them, and again, not to be paternalistic, well, this is how you have to listen to a podcast. This is how you have to listen. Don't want to go quite that far, but it's interesting. Because if it were in a classroom, I have no problem saying something. We're going to restrict what we're going to be using in the classroom in terms of technology. I would have no problem saying that. But somehow, you know, when this class is online, now I almost feel like, well, I'm not going to tell them how to use their machines. That's weird to me. Why am I doing that? Why am I hesitant in some ways? So I think just listening to to what you were just saying a minute ago, I think that's a great way to, as you say, prime the students, give them different techniques that they can be trying out talk with them about the experience that they're going through and just kind of acknowledging that. And maybe there's some kind of of segue, you know, and we don't have to come back to it right now or ourselves, but maybe there's some kind of segue where the student then says, oh, okay, this is how I was learning information when I was in school. Now, what can I do with my patient to help her better understand what's going on with herself? How can I connect with her? And it totally depends on the patient, right? It depends on a, you know, it depends on so many factors depends on their comfort and familiarity and ability with certain devices and technologies. But I think that kind of learning can be applied in some ways to what a physician might be doing with a patient. And again, not an MD, as I say all the time, right, to my students, but I in many ways think that what y'all are doing is you're teaching. And you don't necessarily always think of it that way, but I think that's what you're doing with patients, right? You're teaching us how to live that healthier life and you're trying to show us how to alleviate certain problems that we might have. And so broadly speaking, I think that we have that kind of kinship from a medical practitioner and educators. So we need to be teaching each other how better to address our audiences. That's a great point. If you know how to reach your students or any other educational environment, then you could potentially utilize a lot of those 
same techniques for your patients. Patients often misunderstand, misinterpret what the physician's saying, and that's just not a skill right. that's often developed, but definitely could benefit a lot of patients. And I know you've written about how diagnostic errors could reduce tens of thousands of deaths a year, but maybe it's not just the diagnostic errors we should be focused on, but the patient education aspects that still might be lacking in certain areas. Absolutely. I mean, how do we talk to patients about how to use WebMD or whatever they're using? I don't know what the specific websites they might be using, but how do you talk to someone about using that, right? And I think the easiest way, again, non-practitioner, but the easiest way would just be to tell me if you use it and how you use it. And maybe you don't, or maybe you do. They're not going to be able to read the vast majority of the articles that are coming out in medical journals. And I'll say me. I can't understand that, right? The vocabulary, you know, test of the keywords is beyond my ability. Okay, but we are going to go and, you know, we being patients, like we're going to go and look at forums. We're going to listen to what other people are saying. We're going to go read, you know, social media and then think we have an understanding. Okay, so that's also dangerous, you know, that overestimation of what we think we know. So how can the physician mediate that relationship in some way? How can you teach us how maybe best to use some of these technologies or how best to use the information that we find on the web and when there are limits, right? And you know this, right? There are limits. I shouldn't go attempt to diagnose myself and then say, oh, well, this is the best medication to treat what I think I have. Let me see if I can find that online too. I can probably, right? I mean, you could probably find, again, there's limits, but lots of different kinds of medications. And then I start medicating myself What's the point of the physician? Well, there's a lot of problems with this situation in this scenario, and that's certainly not something we want our patients doing. Again, I'm not claiming that this is an artifact of the 21st century. People have been self-medicating for, you know, perhaps ever. But what are some of the best practices from a physician standpoint? You're not writing yourself out of a job here by helping the patient understand better how to use online information, but you might be making your job significantly more enjoyable because maybe your patients are going to be more open with you and they're going to tell you, oh my gosh, I read this article. And how you respond to us is significant. You know, if you're scoffing and deriding that source or something, okay, well, maybe now I'm not going to come back and want to talk to you about that. But if you're open and you're listening, like, oh my gosh, okay, that's interesting. Maybe I need to look at that too. Okay. Again, that's not saying that you agree with it. That's not saying that you buy into whatever that article is saying, but you're acknowledging that I am trying to do something for my own health benefit and we can be, and this is a stretch perhaps, on some sort of quasi team together. Because I think, you know, the physician, you're not able to do it all by yourself. You have to have buy-in from your patients. We have to want to do the things that you're telling us to do. And so we have to believe that you're hearing us. You know, we have to believe that you're meeting us in some senses where we are. That doesn't mean that you condone everything that we do and you agree with us all the time. But I think it does mean that you're showing us that what we're bringing to you is real information. Definitely. And I know we're coming up on quite a bit of time here and we've covered so much material. We don't want to overload the audience too much, maybe. Do you have any last minute thoughts or resources that you would recommend? My hope is, Chase, that this kind of conversation continues, whether it's you and I talking again at some point in the future, whether it's others who have heard this and agree or disagree with some of the things that I'm saying or that you're saying and want to engage more directly with this. I think, you know, the theme that you've been mentioning and that I'm some way picking up on here is less passivity. How do we become more active? And so from a student standpoint, engaging with faculty on these kinds of questions and topics and acknowledging the fact that some faculty just won't want to engage you with that, right? Because they've gotten to where they are. They're extremely successful. Okay. But there are going to be others, I think, that do want to talk more about this. And if you're, you know, a medical student or a pharmacy student, or gosh, any of these other, you know, health professions, if you're noticing something where, you know, something like, and again, I think that there's some regrets on this where people are perhaps beginning to slow down on doing some, you know, private personal genetic testing. But if you're, you know, training as a physician or a physician, gosh, you know, my patients are asking a lot of questions about genetic testing. Of course, there's genetic counselors. There are those who have, you know, more specific training in this. And so that might be something that maybe there needs to be more education in terms of, from a medical school standpoint, 
not to say, oh, well, we're going to teach you to be, and I'm in no way saying this, we're not going to teach you to also be, you know, a genetic counselor. No, but what are the resources that you have available to you? And then how do you have this conversation with the patient? How do you help her, you know, talk to that genetic counselor, for instance? I think figuring out from each school standpoint, and again, I think the students could be the drivers of this in many ways. What is it that they want more of? What is it that they want and need? You know, do they have, again, I'm going to say this, right? Do they have enough bioethics, medical ethics? Do they have enough opportunity to have these kinds of conversations? Maybe they need to have more of that. And that's something I think that students can drive and they can look to their faculty or, you know, the administration and say, are you able to bring in, you know, some other kinds of options for us? And maybe some of this is online. You know, again, I'm not saying some sort of like massive open online class, because again, I think you have potential for less active learning there. But that might be something to consider is from a student standpoint, being a bit more aggressive and identifying gaps or identifying areas that they want more training in. And how do we teach them to say that without saying, I feel like I'm undereducated in a certain area. Because again, ego is not a bad word, but we don't want to make you know a student feel like, oh, well, I can't believe that student over there doesn't understand bioethics, you know, or something like everybody else does. I don't want it to in any way be like that. Something where we can make it open, where the students are eager to do and have these kinds of conversations. That's not a specific resource. And so I don't think I'm, I'm really answering your question and being that helpful here, but that's what I would recommend. <laughs> no, still advice is perfect. And I disagree on the MOOC thing, but that's for another episode. Yes, <laughs> we might yes, have to yes. come back because uh, I do a, a part two because I have a lot of thoughts and theories on that one. But Good. And I will definitely link your article in the show notes. Is there any way for audience to reach out to you if they wish you? Yes, please. I want you to include my email address in there as well. It's just william.davis at cnsu.edu. That's the easiest way to contact me. There's a phone number. I'm not sure anyone listening to podcasts calls people on the phone anymore. So there's a phone number. If that's interesting to anyone, I can put that on there. And the email is absolutely the easiest way. I would also like to promote, it's where the article is located, but the Social Epistemology Review and Reply Collective. It's a great interdisciplinary connection of scholars talking about a wide variety of topics. If any student or professional or practitioner or non-practitioner wants to engage on any of these topics, and that could be through the written form, through podcasts, through video, whatever it would be, I am eager and happy to do so. As you can tell and your audience members can tell, I'm long-winded and love to talk. So I'm very happy to continue this conversation elsewhere. Great. (laughs) William Davis, PhD, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Chase. Thank you very much. 